today's uh, conversation is uh, learning from the pandemic, specifically learning from the pandemic and not learning during the pandemic. Because even though uh, we will probably have uh, opportunity to commiserate about uh, what we've all had to deal with in terms of uh, being teachers or being parents and guardians, uh, or in fact, even being students ourselves. Um, but this dynamic panel of four alumni educators uh, will offer things that potentially are constructive. And um, at, during the conversation, hopefully we will get to a point where um, they can tell you or share what how they think uh, you as parent guardian uh, can be an ally of, uh, of, of teachers. And in terms of looking at perhaps the constructive, what are the good takeaways uh, from the pandemic, um, we can look at what perhaps uh, an ideal educational system could and might be. Uh, for indeed, these four panelists are, uh, I think people who we can safely say, uh, turned disruption into um, an opportunity uh, and uh, using sort of their creative uh, capacities. I think, uh, I think we'll, in this brief time that we have today, I think um, we'll hear some really interesting ideas. And um, I'd like to start. Oh, one, one, one more thing. I'm going to interrupt myself. Um, I will say that last year, Careers Life in Yale had a panel of uh, K-12 public school teachers. Uh, this panel um, is more private school teachers. Uh, but what happened last year after uh, getting together with uh, the K-12 teachers was the ball was rolling and now there is a brand new um, Yale Alumni Shared Interest Group, Yale Alumni Educators, uh, which is for educators, but also those people who were even interested in education. So I will put my email in the chat and uh, you can uh, contact me if you would like to get on the mailing list or simply like to know more about the group, would like to get more involved. Uh, so without further ado, I would like to get things underway here uh, by asking each of our panelists to introduce themselves and to share something about their pandemic experience. And um, I think we'll go alphabetically last name. Uh, so that means, uh, Jess, do you want to get, get things started? Absolutely. Um, so thank you so much, uh, Stephanie, for that intro and for organizing this and inviting us to join. I'm very excited to um, be here today. Um, I am very much right in the trenches uh, of education right now. Um, I am the director of an early childhood center and we are a little short on staffing this week. So I literally was just covering a classroom. Um, I am uh, a graduate of Yale College, um, class of 2008, Silliman, um, uh, and uh, a little bit on my background. Um, I grew up in New Haven, I am a proud, uh, New Haven, uh, born and raised. Um, I went to public school for K-12 in New Haven um, before deciding to stay um, for Yale, wonderful decision. Um, my mother uh, taught as public school teacher in New Haven. Um, so I have a deep grounding in, in public education um, and also uh, a deep love for this city. I'm currently in New Haven. Um, I, after Yale, I joined Teach for America. I taught in uh, New Orleans. I taught first grade um, in post sort of few years after Katrina. Um, I decided I loved New Orleans. Um, so I'd originally um, deferred a consulting job and planned to do that after a couple of years um, in New Orleans and decided I couldn't leave. So I stayed in New Orleans for seven years um, working in schools there. 
um, as a teacher in early childhood grades and then an administrator. Um, decided to move back up north to be a little closer to family. Um, went uh, to that, that other school in Cambridge for graduate school um, in education and then uh, landed in New York City where I worked for um, the last five years um, for the city of New York on early childhood policy. Um, so I uh, was working for the expansion of um, three-year-old and pre-K in New York City, which is now universal under former mayor Bill de Blasio's initiative. Um, and then just in January, um, my wife and I had twins last summer. And so we decided to uh, get a little help from the grandparents, move back to New Haven. Um, so I'm currently back in New Haven, um, just a few blocks from Yale. I um, currently work as the executive director of the Connecticut Children's Museum, um, which is in downtown New Haven, has a children's museum as well as a childcare center um, for birth through five. So um, my experience, which I'll talk a little bit about today, um, in the pandemic was um, at first in New York, I was um, working for the city of New York when um, the pandemic hit. And as you all know, um, hit New York in um, just uh, extraordinarily um, catastrophic ways um, on, a, on a personal level for so many New Yorkers um, and on the education system, just a, a, a disruption um, to the scale that we had never seen. Um, I, at the time, um, was tasked with opening our emergency child care centers across the city, um, which served the children of um, first responders, of hospital workers um, from uh, birth to five, because all, pretty much all of the child care, um, as I'm sure many of you experienced, was shut down um, during uh, that first few months of COVID. Um, so I'll be talking a little bit about some of the lessons learned there. I think, you know, while it was of course, an extremely challenging time. I think there were some pretty incredible things that were done and, and ways that um, communities were brought together to support um, the education of some of our youngest children during um, such an uh, unprecedented time. And now in my work currently, um, I am continuing to work with some of our youngest kiddos um, now in the private sector um, through the work of the Children's Museum and the private child care center that we run. Um, we actually serve a number of Yale affiliated families here. Um, many uh, children of uh, either faculty or um, staff at Yale. Um, so we'll be, we'll be excited to talk a little bit about that. Okay, I guess I'm next <laughs> in alphabetical order. Um, <clears throat> hi everyone, my name is Mike Fishback. Uh, I graduated Yale College in 2001. I'm realizing listening to Jessica, uh, I have a lot in common with Jessica. I also went uh, to public schools K through 12. I have a graduate degree from the other place up in Cambridge in education. Um, I have a same sex partner and two young children. <laughs> and I like Jessica also, I um, at the beginning of the pandemic, I was uh, in the public system and I'm now um, at, a, at an independent, uh, in my case, independent school, private school. Um, I guess so. A, a, so a little bit just about my background. Beyond that, um, I, uh, I I've been teaching ever since I graduated uh, college. So I'm, I'm a little bit a uh, little bit more than twenty years now. Um, I did take a few years off to to be a, a full time parent, which was uh, a wonderful thing to do. And I, you know, one of the great things about teaching is that. Um, we're not we're not in a in a career where we're necessarily looking for promotion all the time. We can we can kind of leave and come back more easily than a lot of other professions. And so I took advantage of that. Um, I I've taught mostly in independent schools, uh, middle school uh, humanities, so social studies, language arts, a little bit of theater, uh, and I've I've also been a um, adjunct professor of education in higher ed for a little bit. Um, but I, I did when I when I finished my uh, full time parenting and came back to education, I started working in a charter school in San Diego where I was living at the time. Uh, and that's where I was when the pandemic started. And I was actually in an interesting position in that I was um, beginning to beginning a process of relocating our family from San Diego to San Jose, seven hours north. Um, and the, I was in talks with my current school, a private school to teach there. So I was kind of I experienced the beginning of the pandemic. Um, being in a charter school, and then uh, later in the, the the full pandemic school year at a private school, and the differences were amazingly stark. Um, both of my schools 
in terms of administration, it really did a great job and tried their best. And what, what we realized, as, as, as Jessica alluded to as well, um, a lot of the inequities that everyone's known about and some, a lot of the inequities have been hidden to a lot of people um, really became um, undeniable. And so what I, in my charter school, uh, which, is, which is intentionally socioeconomically diverse, um, so there were uh, upper middle class families, there were lower income families. Uh, a lot of our lower income kids um, kind of we <laughs> they they weren't able to be as present. Um, we lost touch with a few of them at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, a lot of them who really tried, you know, were in situations where they, um, you know, they were living in a smaller apartment with lots of siblings. Their parents had to be um, out doing doing jobs as essential workers, couldn't be there supervising. They didn't have um, spaces to be doing their work and, and remote learning on their own. They didn't have internet access or reliable internet access. And so, um, and so as a result, you know, their learning suffered. In my private school, when I got there in, in September and we, we opened for in-person learning uh, in October, 2020. Um, so we were in the first wave of doing that. Um, our kids here really have uh, what they need. They have, um, the food they need, they have the uh, parental support they need, parents who are able to be there, um, a lot of whom are able to be at home with them. And, um, and so because of that, my pandemic experience has been kind of starting, at, at least when I moved to my current school, starting with like, what can we do when kids are as supported as they can be in a pandemic situation? Um, how do we make it the best it can be. And so um, I kind of have, have two big takeaways that I'll just preview and then we'll get into it later as we have a discussion. One is that um, I noticed the parent-teacher communication really became stronger and more frequent and more positive. Uh, it, it, our administration um, set the set the standard in saying like, we're, we're gonna treat everyone as generously as possible because we know everyone's having a tough time and we're gonna work on um, giving everyone the benefit of the doubt and uh, really being appreciative. And what I noticed as a teacher and I and in my role as a parent too, um, parents have been so effusive in in uh, talking about um, what they're appreciating, what they're celebrating about, what the, the teachers are doing. Parents are having more conversations with their kids about their schoolwork as they either watch it happening on, on Zoom in the beginning of the pandemic or, or, or kids bring it home. And they're letting teachers know about um, what's been happening and, and, and how much they value uh, what the teacher has been putting into to their kids' education. And so I hope that that, um, to the extent, and that's only my experience, I can't speak for everyone, but um, in my school environment, that's been our experience and I hope that continues. Uh, and then the, um, the other thing I, I wanted to say is that the emphasis on social and emotional learning has been really important. Uh, our school doubled down on that, we, we put a lot of time in our pandemic schedule to small groups of kids meeting with teachers uh, to just not just think about resilience, but about self-care. Um, how do you take care of yourself and your families and other people? Um, and uh, I hope that that will continue as well. We realized that that's needed and it's not just needed during a pandemic, but it's needed all the time. Uh, we cut down on homework drastically because we knew that when kids were on the screen all day, we didn't want them to be on the screen after the school day even more. So we just said, look, we're gonna, we're gonna um, just not, not assign as much extra work that they can do during school hours. That has been incredible for the kids' education. I've, I and a lot of other teachers have kept that up where we just haven't assigned lots of homework. Um, and there's a lot, decades of research about um, the, uh, the, the minimal positive effects, if not uh, counterproductivity of homework um, for many kids. And um, just the, the respect about the kids' lives as people, not just as students, um, you know, when the work day's over, you go home, you have a life, you enjoy your time uh, with recreational activities, you're able to, your brain is now able to, to, to process and get the learning from the day to stick more than, than if you're constantly engaged in work. So things like that, that, um, We've, we kind of did because of the pandemic conditions, but now that we're um, emerging from them somewhat, uh, I hope these are things that that continue. So that's what I'll say for now, and I look forward to the conversation. Thanks, Mike. I think I'm up next. I am Orly Friedman, and I have the unique distinction of launching a school in the middle of the pandemic. 
Um, and that was not my intention. And I'll back up a little bit and share my story and how I ended up uh, opening a school September 2020. Uh, after Yale, I joined Teach for America as well and taught elementary school in Washington, DC. I taught there for five years, but always had this dream ever since my days at Yale of opening my own school one day. So after five years in the classroom, I was ready to take the next step toward launching a school and ended up going to business school at Stanford and heading out to California to get some leadership and management experience to help me launch that school. And also use my time out in the Bay Area to visit some of the innovative classrooms and companies to, um, to put together my ideas about what the school I wanted to launch would look like. And in the process of doing that, I ended up getting in touch with Salcon from Khan Academy, which is an online learning platform. And he happened to want to open a school of his own for his five-year-old son. So right after graduating from business school, I helped him launch this brick and mortar school called the Khan Lab School, which is in Mountain View, California, associated with Khan Academy, but it's a, a real life school with kids that go there every day. And um, so I helped build that school from scratch and really got to try out a lot of um, different ideas while I was there, mostly in the role of head of lower school. And what I became more and more interested in while I was at Khan Lab School was this idea of student agency. When you have tools that allow kids to learn anything, anywhere, anytime, what's going to differentiate those that are successful um, from those that can't really take advantage of the tools is what we call work habits. So how, um, how capable they are of setting goals for themselves, managing their time, staying focused, similar to executive function skills, really. And so after four years at Khan Lab School, I left and was ready to launch a school of my own. So that was in September of 2018. I set off on this journey to launch a school and I thought, you know, how long is it going to take until this school can open? Um, and I thought probably about two years and 2020 is such a nice year to open 2020 vision. It just felt right. So we set the launch date of September 1st, 2020, um, not knowing what was in store and uh, spent the first year just sort of researching and refining this model around student agency. And then the second year doing the logistics of recruiting families and finding a location for the school. And um, in March of 2020, we had just sent out admissions offers to our first class. We admitted everyone who applied. Um, and that was exactly the time that lockdown started. And everyone had just enough time to start worrying about the uncertainty of the next year. And, um, and so that really threw a wrench in our plans. And um, for a while, I wasn't sure that launching a school was really something worth doing anymore. I was listening to the daily podcast and reading news articles about people dying around the world. And it felt like, why launch a new school? There are so many bigger problems going on in the world right now. Um, but after about a week of thinking that way, I realized that the model that we were trying to put in place was probably gonna be more important than ever because what we are trying to do at Red Bridge, which is the name of the school that I've started, is really teach students how to take ownership of their learning. And in March, 2020, all of these students were sent home um, to really be self-directed in their learning for the first time. Um, there was no teacher standing over them telling them what to do and what they needed to be successful when they transitioned to learning at home, online, in a new context were these work habits, which is what Red Ridge really specializes in teaching. Um, and so I was newly inspired to continue on with the launch of Red Bridge. And we, according to plan, ended up launching September 1st, 2020 in San Francisco. Um, and so we just finished our second year of operation and um, have lots of stories and learnings from our two years in the pandemic. Um, very fortunately, we are able to stay open in person for those full two years. Um, and I am happy to get into more of our experience and more of 
um, how our curriculum, I think, helps students be more flexible when these uh, disruptions arise throughout the rest of this conversation. And I'll hand it over to Claudia now. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you for the invitation to be part of this um, panel. I'm Claudia Portogallo, and um, I'm calling in from Germany. Um, I'm not working in a private school. I'm working in a public school for... Um, it's, um, it's a school for exceptionally able and talented uh, young adults. Uh, I'm related to Yale because I did a PhD in classics and Renaissance studies and then went on to teaching here, um, Greek and Latin uh, for um, kids aged 14 to 18. Um, but I'm also teaching digital humanities uh, or, or public relations um, in not the core curriculum, but uh, the additional interest-based curriculum. I'm also a boarding school mentor here in the school. And um, so it's a very dynamic role. And uh, as a boarding school, we still had to uh, send our young students home several times. And uh, that was especially hard for the, um, for the older kids who, um, well, they are no longer kids, they're actually young, uh, adolescents, young adults, right? yeah, uh, the, the ones who are facing uh, life-changing choices, life choices, um, what do I study, where do I go from school, um, and accompanying them in pandemic times and, and trying to uh, be mindful of all the difficult uh, decisions they have to uh, face was... Um, enriching but um i want to go back to to mike who said uh, that parents were very appreciative we what what i did as a boarding school mentor was um i reached out to to everyone to be in conversation and uh that's something that's sort of also one of the takeaways i want to emphasize that um we as teachers we're in the profession because uh we have a passion for it so if people trust us um, and trust everyone else around them that they are willing to do the best they can and then keeping in conversation with one another is a is a way to create community to build communities and also to move forward and sort of face uh, obstacles in a resilient manner so that that's sort of the gist I, I keep it brief because we're already quite quite far ahead in in our conversation so Right. Thank you all. Um, I, in fact, you know, it, it, as you're saying, Claudia, we already have uh, questions, comments in the chat, so we can uh, go to our our attendees. Starting with John, can you uh, go ahead and ask our our, our four your your question? Yeah, sure. I, without without repeating myself, I'm in the. Uh, somewhat unusual position, lacking uh, uh, classroom uh, education experience as all of the uh, kind of expert panelists here have. I got into this world of, uh, of STEM programs and particularly program effectiveness with underrepresented minorities and girls uh, through, the, through a different lane of, of public service, not not through education, um, but I uh, I feel as if um, looking at this from the perspective of a government agency, which is which is funding uh, programs, uh, mostly competing for uh, time and attention outside of school. So I'm thinking some may be familiar with um, the first robotics with the family with the uh, family math program called Math Counts, um, with, with, with competitions um, and with programs that, that, that serve under, underrepresented populations, um, community colleges, uh, historically black colleges and universities. We tend to hear from the perspective of the funded programs, we hear an awful lot about their successes, about how they, in particular, how they have uh, uh, 
built uh, capacity, built virtual capacity, and how they have succeeded in reaching more kids. And I, and I feel as if we're just getting part of the story. Let me let me give a, a specific example. Uh, Morgan State University in Baltimore with a great outreach program quadrupled their their in-person uh, signature expo. Instead of having a thousand kids in a gym, they had four thousand kids, and they and they arranged for the teachers to uh, um, uh, bring their classes with them, and they kept the material online. Sort of, uh, they gave it a, a six month shelf life. So we only heard the good news side of this. And yet when you go to a college prep program, I happened to be in San Diego recently and, and heard about the AVID program. Again, one which I'm sure is familiar to many who are on this call. And the, and the uh, president of elect of AVID talked about the last two years as probably the worst ever for teachers, there were 5,000 teachers in the room, avid volunteer teachers. It's just, I ha I'm having a lot of dissonance between what we're hearing, what, what funders are hearing internally, oh yes, we used your dollar so successfully, and what, and what, and what teachers are saying and what research is saying about, about, the, about the, the costs of this disruption. So, it's really that's the issue, I think, that, and I think that that's a pretty fundamental issue for us. Uh, I, I mention was made of whether or not there was some silver lining in in this disruption, and whether it could be used to to really uh, reinvent things. Maybe that's more possible at private schools, but I, I'd be very interested in the in the panelists' thinking and and their perspective on that on that pretty broad issue. Well, so we did a survey among our students um, about how they were, um, whether they had uh, broadband access to the internet, whether they had their own personal computer, um, how engaged and motivated they felt even after 10 weeks of lockdown. And um, because 90% um, had access to broadband internet, their own personal computer, a study space, and uh, stuff like that, they still felt, and, and we used flipped classroom as one of the methods, had frequent conference calls, but it kept them brief. Um, the outcome wasn't too bad. Nevertheless, <laughs> learning is always emotional and social. And um, especially in, in this school where, um, like being in a boarding school and living with the people you meet in the classroom is sort of the most exciting thing. <laughs> um, that component um, broke away. And um, as boarding school mentors, we tried to find modes of engagement uh, with the students in, in that manner, uh, even in a virtual space. But um, so after two years, we see that students are worn out um, and we are glad that we are back together and that we can um, build up um, this social emotional learning process um, all together as a community. But yeah, in the process, I think we, we lost only a few and not as many that may be different in other places. And I'm well aware that is, I'm speaking from from this position of uh, well-equipped uh, families. Yeah, something I would add, and and you know, John, it wouldn't it wouldn't surprise me that um, the kids in their schools and their regular school programs might be having a really hard time, and also they're having really great success with um, extracurricular type um, uh, uh, hands-on experiential. Uh, activities like you're describing. Um, there's there's a, a great work um, that is 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 a book that came out maybe a year or so ago by John Maida at Harvard and Sarah Fine at the High Tech High Graduate School of Education um, about uh, where deeper learning happens in schools. And 
they went they went and toured high schools around the country looking for the most meaningful learning. And what they found is um, basically all the great stuff happens outside of the classroom. It happens in in activities where, they, as you say, they're they're building, they're creating, they're they're testing, they're doing competitions, they're making prototypes, they're doing something that matters to them. And I think that's why programs like yours, where you're funding activities like that. Um, might see successes even in times, and maybe especially in times when the rest of the education they're getting feels so um, difficult and in some cases lower quality than usual. And I mean, my hope is for the entire education system that um, the core curriculum of schools starts to look more like extracurricular activities, where the more teachers try to to do that in their disciplines, and it looks different in every discipline. Um, that th the more that people who who have um, who have influence over the education system can can push in that direction, the more meaningful learning will be for kids, um, both during the pandemic and and after. Yeah, I think you touched on something uh, in in your comments, John, about teachers, and I think I heard you talk about like sort of teachers feeling burnt out and the experience of teachers. I think that, um, so I, I'm kind of on the other side of the age uh, spectrum from uh, uh, Claudia and Mike um, at the younger level and early childhood, um, whether you call it early childhood or childcare, or I think the two are kind of used interchangeably. Um, I would say we are currently facing a, a huge staffing crisis that um, existed prior to um, the pandemic, but has only been dramatically exacerbated by the pandemic. I think people are, starting to hear light of it. There's been some stories and some press about it. It always existed and now it's worse than ever because um, uh, given the jobs economy has been actually decent, it's you can make a lot more at an Amazon or um, frankly now like at retail um, or a restaurant than you can in many of our early childhood centers that are taking care of <clears throat> the majority of our kids, our youngest kids in this country. Um, and that's whether it's public or private. Um, any setting really. Um, and so I think uh, what we're hearing a lot, we've heard a lot in New York and I hear even in this center, which I will say is like a um, a center with a relatively robust resources given um, you know where we sit and, and who we serve um, is that our our teachers are are tired. They're saying, listen, like we showed up when, you know, essential work, we were, you know, we were an essential worker. When everybody else was working from home, we, we showed up under, you know, very um, uncertain times and uh, we came and we took care of your kids to the country, they're saying, and like, what do you, what, what's, what's in it for us now? Um, and I think that is the challenge is people are really tired and it's frankly just really hard to find people to work in um, early childhood right now. Um, the upside of that is that I think it's starting to get attention, right? Like during the pandemic, when everybody was home with their young children, they realized, wow, the, the jobs these people do are really, really hard. Um, and it's real work and it's intellectually rigorous work and it's just exhausting. <laughs> um, and so I think we're starting to see not only the social and educational benefits of early childhood, but I think have been established over the last 10 years with a lot of the brain research, but we're also seeing a lot of the economic benefits and just the, so the, the larger socioeconomic benefits of, of early childhood education. And I think teachers are starting to be more vocal in their advocacy around um, policy changes and support for it. Now, we are nowhere we need to be, right? Build Back Better did not has not gone through. We did not get the massive infusion that I think many people in the industry were hoping for yet. Um, but that, if anything, I think that mobilization um, has certainly been an upside. Um, and I hope we'll continue to grow uh, as we uh, move forward. But it, it's 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 very tough right now in, um, in 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 sort of the early childhood trenches. Orly, do you have anything to add? Um, I guess the only thing I would add on to maybe what Mike was saying is, I think that part of the reason that the after school programs are so successful is because that's where students can feel a sense of agency and ownership over their learning experience um, and so much of that 
was taken away during the pandemic um, for students, especially when you're relying on digital tools that kind of choose things for you and push you forward and you have very little say in like how you learn and what you're learning next. Um, so these out of school time uh, programs are where students actually get a voice and that agency is more important now than ever. Um, and even before the pandemic, a uh, sense of agency in high school students has had been declining over the last 50 years and um, a lack of a sense of agency is associated with depression and anxiety, which we also know has been rising over the last 50 years and got even worse during the pandemic. So I think thinking about ways that we can empower students to make choices about their own learning is more important now than ever. So that actually, uh, your comment Orly, is, is a good segue to uh, what Manuel has been uh, sharing in the chat. Uh, and in fact, uh, finally, Manuel, uh, do you want to ask your question of the of the panelists? Been for about fifty years at Yale, at Princeton, uh, New York Law School, Fordham Law School, Inter-American Law School, which you see behind in terms of the tropics and in Puerto Rico. So the question I had with the remote learning was the real impact it had, not only on the students, but on the teachers. A lot of folks focus on the students. The students did not progress as much. Uh, the students this, the parents had these problems. But the teachers had a problem of adapting to a new technology. And for some schools like John Jay, the reports that I have, and the people that I know teaching there, they lost students, but they also lost teachers. They also lost interest. You talk about teacher and passion, they lost passion because they couldn't communicate. And so no one was teaching the pedagogy of remote learning. How do you do this? And how do you do it successfully? My thing, the first thing I, tell, I would tell my students, I don't want to see your rooms. Put out a background. I don't want to know about the, the dog and the, the cat and everything else that's going on, right? I want to know about you. And so I had to spend time on how's it going for you, which was not part of the normal law school education. It's more a, here it goes. So the question is, what was the impact on you as you had to literally readapt, refit, this mechanism and try to really assure some kind of contact. So I said, don't sit. I, right now I'm standing. So my folks don't sit, they stand because teachers stand. Teachers don't sit in general, okay? And so from the basics of doing that, how did you deal with it? That's a question. Who wants to take that first? I'll, I'll talk a little bit about my experience and, and, and you know, each of us has our own, um, you know, stories of the opening weeks and months of remote learning. For me, um, working at my charter school, I had, um, I was very fortunate to be part of a teaching team of a few teachers in our middle school who ha could, could create our schedule um, on our own without, without having to like coordinate with everyone else in the, in the school. And what we did was we took large classes of nearly 30 kids and broke them down into small groups so that we could, um, we were meeting less often, they didn't get as much Zoom time, but we were really connecting with each kid um, every day. And, uh, and as a writing teacher, I basically torpedoed my curriculum, what we were gonna do. Uh, we were a project-based school. And so we, you know, the project we, we had in store, we set aside and I basically had them do creative writing and, and written responses to what was happening in the news. And we would just workshop their writing. Um, and so I tried to make the curriculum more relevant to their experience. And as you're saying, built in time for them to talk about and process their experience. And then I think one of the strengths of what many teachers have been able to do, and, and I've talked with a lot of teachers around the country who, who do have autonomy of curriculum to be able to do this is to is to reset their curriculum so that it is speaking to 
um, what's happening in the moment. A lot of, especially history and social studies classes are much now more, um, more in sync with current events and helping kids understand why what's happening is happening and what they can do, how they can be empowered to, to um, not just at the individual level, but what impact they can have on, on public policy. Um, and, uh, and that conversation has been really valuable. Um, so for me, that's what, that's what I was able to do. Um, it's, it's funny. I, I also, our school told them, uh, you know, they don't have to show us their, uh, their homes, but the reason was that we knew a lot of them were embarrassed by what their living space looked like. And, um, and so a lot of them were either doing backgrounds or having the camera off, which, uh, was not conducive to, to a, a group learning. So there were, there were a lot of, um, tough things. Also, I'll say just in response to um, uh, Jessica's point about childcare, I started the pandemic with a two-year-old and a very needy two-year-old who was not able to go to his childcare. Um, and so I, I did in the first few months of the pandemic, the spring of 2020, had to be teaching with my husband also working remotely from another room and my first grader on Zoom in another room. And then my two-year-old constantly coming in and, and <laughs> asking for things. And I have to say, like, I am so appreciative of what um, early childhood educators did once a lot of childcare centers went, went back uh, in person very early um, in the pandemic, if they had ever closed at all. Uh, and that that is what allowed me to do my job. And it's what allowed so many parents to do their jobs. And so, yeah, I'd echo everything Jessica said about the, the policy needs um, going forward to, to honor uh, those teachers, especially. Just add on to that last bit, Mike. Um, so at Redbridge, we launched with kindergarten through second grade, and we never were remote, so I can't speak to how we handled that, but um, the families that came to us were really committed to sending their five and six year olds in person. Um, and that was something that as a school, we wanted to make sure we could do one way or another, because at that age, so much of learning is sensory students literally learn by bumping into each other how do i handle this situation or holding a pencil and feeling it in their fingers um, or negotiating sharing materials that's basically everything um, at that age is sensory one way or another and so that just can't happen over a screen and um, because both our parents and our staff was so committed to making sure that we could do learning in person, um, everyone was willing to follow pretty strict testing protocols and, and other protocols to keep the community safe in our first year. Um, and so that is really our perspective on how we handled the early pandemic days. So I, I if, it, if Jess or Claudia, uh, do you have something to add? Because I thought I'd go to our next questioner, uh, which is Farah. Would you please? Hello. <clears throat> Can you guys hear me OK? OK. <laughs> All right. Um, so I am, uh, I am not an educator myself. I have the greatest respect for educators, um, but I am the president of a small foundation. So we only work with one school district, um, the school district my kids go to, and it's a small school district. Um, the, so my question is, um, it's a small school district and we have a lot of parent entitlement, I should say, in the community. <laughs> So let's put it that way. Um, so the pandemic was not great for us. Um, teachers just felt under fire and I, I, I feel for them. Um, and I think coming out of it now, um, you know, they're happy to have made it through a full school year of not being shut down last year, which is great, um, but they're exhausted. Um, uh, uh, so speaking purely from a teacher perspective, I wanted to know, you know, what kind of supports uh, would help teachers feel taken care of, frankly, um, and what kind of things, um, I know, you know, we're in California, so our teachers union is always known for asking for more money, um, but in, yes, aside from salary, um, like what kind of things would you say like would be helpful from a either school site admin, like what, how they can help you or even just like a full, like a district perspective, you know, district level 
situation? What what are the things that are most important? Can I speak to that briefly? Yes. From from the, the experience I have, um, I think there are two things. So um, what Jessica said uh, before that um, there's a lack of uh, staff uh, is one aspect and then um, time constraints. So if the workload would be reduced and if then collaboration between teachers to create new curricula that allow for that kind of um, project-based learning and agency, um, it, it needs to create programs that are effective and good. It just needs a ton of time to prepare them well. And then it needs a ton of time to, to mentor these programs well. And um, I view these, this is the way forward. But um, in order to go that route, we need more time on our hands. And um, I feel this is what we we lack. We lack we we lack the time. We 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 are qualified. We we have the passion. We have the the tools, but we don't have enough time to actually do the work we want to do. Yeah, I I, mean, I totally echo what Claudia said. I think it's tricky, right, Farah? Because you hear like something that's not salaries, and like ultimately, it's really hard sometimes to come up with something that doesn't ultimately come back to finances in some way, right? Like time. I 100% agree that time is the biggest thing um, and it's what we have the least of, it feels like, in education. Um, and I fully believe that it makes the biggest difference in the quality of both education provided and like the quality of life um, and well-being for teachers. Um, and ultimately that means lower ratios um, that allow for common planning time, that allow for meaningful professional development and coaching. Um, meaningful planning time uh, and that uh, I think on top of already you know in many areas and, and this is where I think we see a lot of inequities right like across different settings but um, already feeling like don't have enough time with COVID you've seen a lot of absences you know people out for having to be out for quarantine or isolation or um, and and that teachers having to step in and cover extra classes and that type of thing and so I think both um, the time and then the like flexibility. I think substitute, that something we've seen in the pandemic, something we saw a lot in New York was just how important having access to subs um, and not just a body who you can place in front of a room, but you know, someone who knows the school community and can, um, it doesn't make it more stressful for the teacher to be out um, or the neighboring teacher. <laughs> um, that I think is something that we have just not cracked in a lot of places in education is how to provide that flexibility. We kind of expect teachers like, you always gotta be healthy, you always gotta be there and like ready to go. And that's just not a reality. Um, and I think COVID has exacerbated that in a lot of ways. I have seen some interesting solutions to that um, that I think COVID has driven where people are starting in New York, there were some <clears throat> districts that were like doing sub pools between um, schools that were located in similar neighborhoods. Whereas, you know, uh, just some innovative ideas for consistency, um, but that would be one thing I would highlight. Can I so, add one more thing, just uh, briefly? Sure, Claudia, go ahead. Um, the other thing I found was that um, as teachers during the pandemic, we sort of were the first responders for mental health um, questions um, that came, came up. And so supervision for teachers is another um, thing that would really help um, take off some of the um, load um, teachers are facing. Um, and also recognizing that teachers are sort of inter, the, the, the first interveners for, for mental health questions that students face. So when you, sorry, just to expound upon that, when you say supervision for teachers, since they are the first responders for mental health for children. Um, what does that look like to you? It, would that be like a, uh, in my case, of what I was thinking like a district person who's kind of like the, the, the mental health person who, who helps the teachers uh, when they, you know, when they need it either uh, for children, of course, or even personally, is that, a, is that something? Is that well, it getting... entails a whole web of, of stakeholders, right? Um, so it, it would be um, pro 
a supervision for how do I um, cope professionally with a certain certain aspects? Um, who do I involve? Um, do I have the team of uh, professionals that I would need around me, or can I do I do I know who I can call on um, to to then intervene? And um, but also what what you said in the beginning, um, someone who I confide in, who who I can confide in um, to to analyze and reflect on uh, the experiences I have, and then find a way forward. You know. So as we're getting uh, close to the top of the hour, uh, and I see they're not in the up. Uh, uh, Sanjun, I'm going to go ahead and, because uh, we're getting close to the top of the hour, I'm, I'm going to read your comment because of, there's an implied question uh, there. Uh, it's tough to be a teacher right now. And in fact, um, Sanjun is a teacher in Colorado. Uh, but it's also not a reason to overlook the positive lessons learned about education and working with for our youth. Um, so the implied question there is, uh, what are those positive lessons? Uh, who, who would like to get started? Mike? You know, I, I think just reading through the comments, I think this all comes back to Orly's point about student agency. Um, I think there's a, there's a tension in the chat right now between this, this sense of good things happened in the pandemic and then a lot of people here on the, on the Zoom being like, yeah, but things are really awful. Um, and I think I think one one reason for that is that we have this model of school in the United States and many places in the world, where what school looks like is students come into a classroom, the teacher deposits learning into the students' heads. The students have to get that learning in their heads enough to be able to show that they know it through a test or an essay or whatever, and then that's done, and you move on to something else. And that that kind of education delivery learning delivery model. Um, of course, as to, to quote things in the chat, demotivation and pushback against authority, of course, those things get exacerbated during a pandemic, right? That it's already something you don't want to do. And now you're in, you're in an even worse circumstance having to do it. Um, I think one way out of that is changing what schooling looks like and feels like to kids at all age levels. And, and the de developmental look, looks different for kids depending on how old they are, but having things to do and things to learn about that meet what they're already thinking about, what they're already feeling, what they're already concerned about, um, where they're learning skills that matter to them and they, they see how it matters to them, um, that when, when kids feel like they have choice and autonomy and they're in the driver's seat to some extent or in partnership with an adult, with a teacher, um, then it's something that they want to do and then when they're in a tough situation like a pandemic um everyone can come together and feel like okay we're going to work through this we're going to make this work and it feels like a team um not always my experience has been that it felt that way because i was in schools that that were set up um that it wasn't a learning delivery um but a but a but a partnership and i think that it's hard to do that in large public systems um it's easier to do it in small private schools <laughs> But if, um, if that's the direction we move in, I think we get ourselves out of a lot of the tensions that we're, that we're seeing expressed uh, right now in education. To build on that a little bit, I think what agency allows in both students and teachers is flexibility. It allows you to um, adapt to different situations because you are used to being in control and being able to make decisions. And I think that that is true at an individual level and at an institution level. And what allowed Redbridge to handle the pandemic well was that we could be flexible and nimble and we could change our approach quickly and we could get our parents on board and we could make decisions for ourselves. And I think that. Um, what was such a challenge were these systems that are totally inflexible and when you are a huge school that has to do what district leaders far away are telling you and you don't have flexibility to adapt to your community's needs 
that's when things just break. Um, and so I think if we take something away and how districts and the public system and private schools too need to change coming out of this pandemic is finding ways that they can be more adaptive and flexible when crises happen. And while I hope there's no similar pandemic situation in the future with all that's going on with climate change and whatnot, there's sure to be major disruptions to learning um, and schools from the district level to the teacher and student level just have to become more flexible and adaptive organizations to be able to handle all of that. Jess, do you want to add something? There we are. I really like, I was like nodding along to what Earlier was saying. I think this idea of flexibility and in a lot of ways, right? Like modeling, our system models flexibility for kids. Um, and we want them to grow up to be flexible and adaptable and problem solving. And so the only way to do that is by modeling that in the, the systems and the that we build um, to educate them. Um, I think that one uh, one hope that I, I see a question um, that Beatrice put just like uh, that I think is related around like remedying some of the inequities. I think my biggest hope coming out of the pandemic is that these lessons that we have learned are ones that um, uh, there are opportunities to spread them to places where perhaps like we aren't seeing the positive stories now. Um, because I think, uh, Mike, you talked about this before and sort of the, the contrast you saw in your experience in, in the public and private. Um, I have very much seen that here um, myself. And I think that um, I, as in many areas coming from the pandemic, I truly hope that we can take some of the positive things that we have learned in some of the innovative spaces that have existed um, and, and give access to that um, in places where they have them. Um, I'm, I'm, since you, since you um, made the comment, Sandra, uh, would you like to share your, what your positive takeaway is? Sure, I'm, I'm actually at school right now. <laughs> Um, I, I have, you know, it's summertime for me. I work in um, a charter school outside of Boulder, Colorado and Lafayette. So we're in the Boulder County School District, which is both one of the larger school districts in the state of Colorado. And um, in terms of demographics, um, one of the best funded, the, the best funded, uh, no, we were really, our tax base is such that as a public school district um, and the charters within it. Um, so we deal with more affluence then say a lot of Denver Metro area districts, um, which meant that for us, some of the equity issues looked a little different. Not that we don't have um, students coming from low income families um, and not that we don't have students of color in the district and in my school, but um, some of the positives, I wanna echo what I believe Mike said early on about um, the emphasis on SEL. And, and again, focusing on the positives and really understanding how student and teacher mental welfare and wellness impacts the capacity to learn and carry either the work of creating and holding the learning container or participating in the learning container. Um, and understanding that has, has helped everyone from admin to teachers to families think about, is my student well? If my goal is to get them to learn a certain amount of stuff, which is a very traditional approach to school, then if, if that's my goal, then I still have to take this into consideration. It's not, it's not marginalizing, it's not touchy-feely, it's not something extra, it's actually integral. And I think that integration of the full student into the learning process, and yeah, it does need to happen for teachers in a more explicit way, the way we've done the work for students and thinking about student learning. Um, that to me is one of the big takeaways. Um, and, and, one, and a positive learning moment to ask myself as a teacher, what is, the, what is the emotional tenor of my teaching? Is it making space for my students to enter wholly so that they can then do the learning that's on my curriculum and that meets all of the usual metrics of, of quote unquote learning around you know, test results or, you know, learning X number of skills or being able to engage at this particular level according to Common Core. So we are a few minutes over the hour. Uh, it's middle of the day and being sensitive to people's schedules. Uh, but I would be remiss if I didn't ask one more question and it's very much related to what Allison had, uh, has shared in the chat. Um, it is July 13th, middle of summer, vacation, play, which we all should do. 
Um, what should a parent guardian be doing right now uh, to prepare their students for, for the fall, going back to school? Or what could parents guardians be doing right now uh, in terms of responding to uh, learning during the pandemic? Uh, who haven't we started with before? Uh, Orly. Do you want to go first? Oh, I like what Allison's principal had to say. I uh, I would agree that um, you know uh, giving your child an opportunity to set a goal for themselves over the summer and supporting them in um, making a plan and reflecting on it uh, is a great step. Um, and empowering your child. And that could be as simple as making a new friend at camp, um, or it could be, you know, something bigger, a new skill to learn over the summer or whatnot. Um, but I think probably the, the important role for parents there is just being a support um, and listening and encouraging. There's a book that has been very influential for me called The Self-Driven Child by Ned Johnson and Bill Stixford. And um, it is geared mostly to middle high school age students, but I think it uh, is equally helpful for any age child and parent would find it interesting. Um, and they describe the role of the parent as consultant. And I really like that metaphor. And so as you're thinking about how to support your students with working towards a goal that they have, you can think of it as being a consultant and um, you can't care about it more than they do, but you're just there to offer your support along the way. So that's. So, so Jess uh, says she agrees. Uh... Is, do Mike or Claudia, do you have anything else? No? Okay, thumbs up. No, I know, I, I do. Um, I, oh, okay. <laughs> I, the, the most important thing that a parent can do over the summer is read to their kid, read with their kid, um, just have it be full of books and stories. Um, and if it, uh, for older kids, um, follow the news, talk about what's going on in the world, make them feel connected, not just to um, tough news, but also uplifting stories. Um, and, and the biggest thing for me is, um, as you're looking to echo uh, what people have said, as you're looking for, um, for new skills and things to learn, um, set the tone for your child that um, learning is an amazing experience that, that, that you get excited about. And um, so that when they come to school, they're not thinking, uh, oh, now we're back at school, but we're thinking, great, now I get opportunities to learn stuff. And, and, and if you put your kid in that mindset, uh, you at least start them with, uh, with, with, a, with the best foot forward going into the year, um, especially because I know that, um, yeah, given the current school circumstances, uh, a lot of kids are, are coming in, like they're, they're really thankful for the summer. And a lot of them are coming and dreading the school year. So whatever you can do to, to, to push back on that in terms of tone is useful. Claudia, anything? Well, I would um, strengthen the child, you know, and um, make it believe in itself and its, um, its power to, to move things along. Um, yeah, I stop there. Okay. So as, as Tim has commented in uh, the chat, we have just scratched uh, the surface and, and, and that uh, goes to uh, the wonderful panelists and how they offered things that uh, were very provocative and stimulating. I mean, provocative, not in the wild and crazy sense, but to prompt our, our thinking. Uh, in fact, I would encourage everybody here uh, because, I mean, we know education is the key issue to everything right now. Uh, if you want to keep things going, keep this conversation, um, I encourage you to uh, look more into the new shared interest group, Yale Alumni Educators. Um, there is a Facebook group. Um, if, if, if you want to get connected later, I put my email in the chat. 
uh, this organization, this shared interest group will get more events and more things going. And once again, this is for teachers and anybody who's in, interested in educational issues. And if you're interested in alumni networking in general, do not forget cross campus. If you've not signed up uh, yet, please do so. Uh, go and check it out. Uh, and uh, hopefully we'll see some of you next week uh, when we talk about anxiety. <laughs> so uh, I want to thank you all. Uh, this has been great. And uh, hopefully I'll be seeing the four panelists uh, sometime in the future. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for coming.